So on this channel, I am making a tutorial series on how to make an awesome shmup. And to help us with the design, I'm asking other shmup indie devs for their secret sauce. This is the fourth interview in this series. Our guests today are going to be Mikiel and Alta Haudegen from Hit P Studios talking about their shmup Shield Mate MX. Before we begin, a quick disclaimer, uh, the footage in the background is going to be me having fun with the game and as you can tell I'm a noob and if that offends you then you have to avert your eyes. I will splice in a full playthrough provided by Actane. Actane actually has some really cool Shield Mate MX uh, content on his channel. Um, among them like a five player battle royale with developers themselves on board so be sure to check out Actane's channel. And we recorded all of this way back before Unity announced their universally hated runtime fees. Obviously our views on Unity as a platform have changed significantly ever since. Please keep that in mind. Also, as always, this interview will be available as an audio-only version that you can listen to like a podcast. Um, the link to that is going to be down in the doobly-doo. But now, without any further ado, a warm welcome to Hit P Studios. Hi, thanks for the warm welcome. Uh, my name is Michiel. Uh, I'm uh, one of the two co-owners of Hit P Studio and in, as a developer of our first officially released game, Shieldmate MX. Um, I kind of fulfill the role of uh, lead game designer, uh, level designer, and sort of uh, what little narrative there is, the narrative designer as well. Yeah, hello there. Uh, I'm Alta. I'm the programmer slash co-designer of uh, Shieldmate MX. And uh, Christian, of course, we quote unquote know each other from uh, your Pico 8 uh, uh, game jam that uh, you did a while ago and uh, i was forced to participate <laughs> you were forced to participate and who forced point. you <laughs> <laughs> yeah so some guys uh, from the from uh, one of the discords uh, must have been acting right? kind of pushed me into it a little bit it was amazing mm. fun i had a I had a really great time um I was watching uh, your videos before that uh, jam started, and then nice. uh, at some point I, I joined in a bit later, and then I quit a bit early. But it was really fun. Like I made the, a D make uh, of our own game, basically, right? So that's how we know each other. This is the first time we're actually talking, though. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm the, the developer uh, behind uh, Shoot My MX, and Shoot My MX is not a Pico 8 game. It's uh, made in Unity. Is uh, released currently on PC for uh, Windows, Mac, and Linux, and where we are working on the console ports. I am mainly focusing on getting performance uh, up to literal speed, uh, mainly for the the Switch, which is quite challenging, mm. but also quite fun. So that's what we're currently doing, and yeah, uh, as you said, we're talk we're here to talk about design work, but also, I guess about how to technically accomplish that design work, workflow, yeah. uh, things like that, right? Yeah, we. I'm super interested to see how you guys made it. So do you are this is like the fourth interview I'm doing. And, you know, for people watching this, it's going to be the same questions, broadly speaking, but the answers are going to be hopefully wildly different. Um, one of the reasons why is because obviously you are, you use a very different engine from our previous interviewers. Uh, you used Unity to make uh, Shieldmate MX, right? That's correct, yes. So uh, why, why Unity? The main reason why Unity is because I had already been using Unity uh, for quite a while. So obviously using tools that you're already familiar with uh, is always a, a good choice. Yeah. Uh, might be much more important than, you know, what an engine, like what comparable engines are are capable yeah of. yeah as they uh, say in photography you know the best camera in the world yeah, is the one that you have you can use and that you have yeah yeah that's true yeah. so i've been using unity for i guess like a decade or something um mainly as a hobbyist uh but also for the last five six years uh professionally so in my in my day job which uh, i still have um um developing unity apps uh, most of the time uh, mm -hmm. but for uh, for enterprise, so not games, but using the same tools in a sometimes similar, sometimes very uh, different uh, environment with uh, very different people. 
So I'm main, mainly uh, developing augmented reality, sometimes virtual reality applications, sometimes phone apps, uh, stuff like that. One one plus of Unity is uh, that maybe wasn't immediately what uh, determined our engine choice is of course that uh, when when you want to port it to other uh, platforms and other systems, uh, yeah, it's fairly convenient. You know, you can you can do that easily with uh, with engines like Game Maker. Yeah, that's that's a huge advantage. I I, I, I must imagine. Um, so, it's uh, how long did it take? Like, it came out in November two thousand twenty one from one from my my data, right? But uh, that was on itch, and then in in two years later, it came out on Steam. It wasn't quite two years, but yeah, it was it was a, a while there. Um, the the main development up until the first uh, itch release, which was not early access or anything. Um, it was a the full game, just we added on more stuff for the Steam release, right? Uh, it was about uh, eight months or so, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, with a little caveat that I was able to reuse uh, a lot of things uh, that I had built in my, you know, previous uh, hobbyist projects. Um, oh, so the initial development phase was just eight months? Yes. Wow, that's Around super that. fast. Yeah, till the 1.0 release from from uh, nothing to the 1.0 release. So we yeah, started it, it somewhere in July yeah. 2020 in the middle of uh, lockdowns and uh, pandemic. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so we, def- we definitely have COVID to thank for that. But yeah, uh, because thank you, COVID. We, yeah, all of a sudden we found ourselves <laughs> with uh, a lot of unexpected uh, free time in our hands. Um, without that, it definitely would have taken us longer. But still. We did that in our free time, right? Both of us have have uh, full time day jobs, um, so yeah, basically, like mo- pretty much all of our free time went into into making this game. And so you, uh, it's you two guys, but you also had uh, another person for the graphics, uh, as I understand, right? Yeah, yes. that is correct. Yeah, that is true. Uh, the the graphics department, uh, as we as we call <laughs> here, the art department, <laughs> the yeah. art department. Yeah, it's. Uh, my cousin, actually, who is ah, who is okay. uh, a three D modeler and illustrator and does all kinds of, of visual things, um, mm-hmm. he did ninety five percent of the of the visuals. Uh, I did some small parts, um, mainly like procedural stuff, like the VFX programming and things like mm-hmm. that. <clears throat> but also some of the like like the bullets and the the shield sprite. Actually, I I made. Ah. Okay. Quite, quite important. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the VFX. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a third person on the team, and you kind of also brought in uh, Ed from Studio Mud Prince. Right? Yeah. We commissioned the music. Uh, did the music for, uh, from him, and it was fairly early in already when we we didn't even have a full on um, art direction yet. We were just messing around with stolen sprites uh, just for for prototypes and everything. Already during that uh, stage, he had created the main stage theme for stage one and a menu theme and a boss theme. Um, yeah, and I think that's about Oh, yeah, game over theme as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is also, I guess, what makes our workflow uh, kind of free-flowing, actually. Because aside from Ed, who we, of course, paid for his uh, music, the three of us who worked on this game uh, yeah, just uh, every week, None of us was doing it for payment, right? We were all just uh, self self financing, putting our own hours into this. Um, so we also didn't really work uh, with uh, anything like Scrum methods or anything like that. We had a Trello board; we still have that, uh, which we put our different tasks on, but no like harsh deadlines or this should be finished by then, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but still, yeah, like. Like you earlier remarked, uh, we still took only about eight months to get to the 1.0 release. So you could say that we were very much driven by passion. And mm-hmm. I think also, um, I think it's important also, uh, you know, just speaking from my role as a lead game designer, that because nobody was on any payroll here, uh, it was important that everybody was just having fun with the project, you know, and everybody got to, um, yeah, put put their, something of themselves into it and, and uh, put their own ideas and uh, creativity into it. 
Hmm, interesting. Yeah, that's, I mean, especially like because working conditions are kind of such a difficult topic these days in the, in the games industry. Oh, so yeah. Like, yeah. So it's kind of refreshing to see kind of like this very, you know, a very um, relaxed approach to, to the game development. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, if, <clears throat> if uh, I would have, if somebody had forced me or I was on a salary to, to work uh, as much on that game in my free time. <laughs> Uh, I would not have been happy. Like it probably <laughs> would have been. You could have called it uh, crunch. Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Like, having like a full job and then not this this entire game project added next to it. Yes, exactly. But um, yeah, like like Michael said, we we didn't have any fixed deadlines or something. Like sometimes we would set some deadlines for us for ourselves, which uh, which can help. Once but, we like, announce a release date, for example, it's yeah, kind of important yeah, yeah. to stick to that. So, towards the end, exactly. Yeah, we, yeah. we announced the release date at some point, and then of course we wanted to keep that, and we actually managed to do so. Um, that was the only time where we had some like actual crunch, uh, but again, it was self-imposed, right? Like if we if we hadn't met any of the dates, then we wouldn't have met them. That's that's fine. We could have put on a put out a yellow letter on Twitter, you know. <laughs> exactly. Dear gamers, we tweet out a day pack. Shield yeah. Manic, Shield is coming out two weeks later as planned. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, also um, now that now that Michael said it, that that's also right. Like we had no real methodology uh, to to how we were working, and that was also quite refreshing because that's of course something that I have to do in my day job. So I probably would have hated to also do that um, mm. in the you know the passion project and the side project. Yeah, and and I think it all worked also because it. I would find this much harder to do if I would have to do this project solo. You know, for starters, of course, I lack the uh, programming skills. But let's say theoretically, this was a solo project. Um, just the fact that I deliver something. Uh, Alter delivers something, uh, his cousin delivers something, that you constantly feel kind of motivated. You know, you've, you've, you feed off of each other's input and creativity. It keeps you, keeps you going as well. Absolutely. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that that seems like like you you are like this very tight knit team that you're pushing each other forward, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so it's eight months the core development time until 1.0. Then you released it in November 2021 on itch, and then afterwards you kept kept working on it, kept improving it, kind of like in this kind of um, I don't know. Yeah, uh, we we slowed down a little bit uh, after that uh, that initial phase. Um, so for the for the Steam release, we we took our time. Um, some of it was voluntarily, like we wanted to slow down a little bit in order not to to burn ourselves out, of course, and like we felt we deserved some some time off. But then uh, we had a lot of uh, overhead, uh, like especially not not uh, game development related at all. Like uh, so, Michiel is based in the Netherlands. I'm in Germany. We had to uh, found a company together, which was much more difficult than you'd oh, expect. Oh no, that's uh, the most difficult part of the development yes. process. So even even though uh, it's the European <laughs> Union and there are um, there are mechanisms in place to make these things easy, in practice they are not really easy and they cost a lot of time and money. It comes down to the details often, <clears> and <throat> yes, those details um, can be real sticky. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Like, like getting uh, notaries of two different countries to. Uh, Reach yeah. some sort of understanding of what paperwork needed to be submitted. Yeah, yeah, that was that <laughs> yeah. was really difficult and, and slowed us down uh, some more. Yeah, um, and, but then at, the, at I think it was during that time as well where uh, we started talking to a publisher for the for the console versions. Yeah. Uh, so you know we we were always doing something. Um, yeah, yeah. Aside, and you used that core. time also to do something very difficult, which is. Uh, create a replay system in the a uh, non-deterministic engine Jesus, that is yeah. Unity. I've heard some troubles from from the Electric Underground interview. That yes. that uh, can you elaborate for people who haven't listened to that interview? It's it's uh, I was getting some like nervous breakdowns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, basically uh, it wasn't fun, and uh, the replays are still a bit buggy, uh, even in the in the current release. I'm still working on improving them. Um, I mean, the, the thing is, uh, in theory, you would love to just record player input and then re-simulate what they had been doing. Um, but with Unity, that is uh, very hard, uh, maybe impossible to do without you know, re-implementing 
uh, deterministic math libraries and, and things like that, which you really don't want to do. Um, but but what exactly is 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 the thing that desyncs with Unity? So you, the problem is that when you repeat the same inputs um, yes. on different systems, then the actual game ends up being slightly different, right? Yeah, and then yeah, it because, desyncs eventually. Yes, because it's not deterministic, right? Uh, the different processors handle floating point operations slightly differently. Then the the error uh, compounds, and at some point it desyncs. And so, like you press left, and the position of the ship will be zero point zero 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 one it, pixels. I think it's off. more uh, what happens on screen. So enemy ships might behave uh, ever so slightly different, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's what both of you have been saying. Like you get these tiny, tiny differences from uh, on different machines, and then at some point, you know, you're gonna go left instead of right, basically. Oh. Um, so what I ended up doing is like a, like a hybrid, uh, hybrid solution where you have kind of snapshots of the, of what was happening during the game, kind of similar to how video encoding is done, right? Where you have keyframes that are yeah. like the, the complete picture and then you simulate from there. Um, and then when, if stuff desyncs, it will eventually resync. At least that's the theory. It doesn't always work. But uh, most of the time it does. So I, I think it's. I came up with a kind of goodish uh, solution for it. But the good thing uh, about the the system that I used is that we have kind of like some uh, measures against cheaters with that with that system. Ooh. But yeah, it's it's not secure at all or anything like that. But nothing is so. Yeah, yeah. I remember like uh, when I was, people were contracting me to make games and they were like, oh, we're going to make like, you know, money uh, rewards for finishing, yeah. for being the best on the leaderboards. Like, no, what are yeah, you basically, doing? <laughs> basically, no. Don't that do will that. be a real in incentive for, for people to yeah, yeah, yeah. basically yeah. Hack, hack the system. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, but basically, the anti cheat is, of course, that. Uh, a replay gets submitted once a high score is uploaded to the leaderboards. So if there's uh, really some uh, foul play uh, going on, you can easily check that in the replay, yeah. of course. Yeah. So somebody would have to hack the replays as well to get to... You, you can't just you know, juke the numbers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and at that point, uh, I would just let it let it slide because uh, respect for, for, for putting in the <laughs> for work. For hacking right? that system. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you could have just learned how to, how to play the game then. I mean, yeah. if, even if you manage to hack the system, I feel like um, like Schwab players know their stuff. You know, they they can recognize if something is fishy. You know, yeah, that's There's how like the, uh, that's how World of Long plays gets all those angry comments all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was kind of impressed because I, I don't quite see it, but <laughs> but yeah. yeah, we had a couple of other uh, technical things that were hard to do. Like the replays were by far the hardest. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> all the uh, backend uh, stuff, that, everything with to do with networking and authentication and, and all that stuff is always a bit complicated. Complicated, but it was kind of straightforward. Uh, the the checkpoint system was uh, was slightly difficult to to implement. So mm -hmm. you know, in in two of our easier uh, modes, um, basically after every stage a checkpoint is created and you can restart the the game from there or pick it up from there again and all those checkpoints get saved so at any time you can go back to any checkpoint that you've created up to a, i don't know the limit i put some limit in there um so that was that led to you know funky things and mm. uh yes intensive uh, testing and uh trying to do robust code uh, if my colleagues at my day job uh, saw my code and some of them have they would uh <laughs> I wouldn't have a day job anymore, but <laughs> that was also kind of intentional. Like I was really enjoying the <clears throat> the freedom of just just going at it, you know. Yeah. No. No uh, code reviews and anything. No code reviews because we. I'm the only coder, so uh, yeah. I mean, of course, some of it is now coming back to to bite me in the behind. Uh, when when optimizing for Switch, uh, sometimes I wish I had started uh, cleaner stuff earlier but you know it was fun that's, so that's how you learn that's how you learn good. next project is going to be way more more uh you know uh, cleaner and and no, you will probably no, anticipate all these no, problems no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, sounds very utopian 
I've, you have to yeah. you have to have a very positive outlook on the future. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> Otherwise, you get you get nothing done. Yeah. Um, I, I something I want to discuss before we get into like the nitty gritty detail of development is um, uh, so so it's called Shield Made, and it's called Shield Made because there is like a very unique, uh, very special mechanic in the game that is kind of a core to the thing. And I wanted to discuss this because first of all, I find it very interesting. I wanted to hear where that came from, but also like to explain to people who haven't played the game how does that the whole thing works. Let me try to to in from my perspective to to re, uh, re, retell how that works, and then you let me know what I got wrong. Hmm. So you, it's a side-scrolling shmup, kind of like uh, I don't know, uh, Gradius, right? And then there's bullets, obviously. And when you get hit by a bullet, then you don't die. Instead, you activate a shield mode where there's like a shield protecting your ship for a couple of seconds. And in that mode, uh, you are kind of invincible to the bullets. You, and in fact, you kind of want to get hit by even more bullets to charge up your ship. Um, and, and so the bullets kind of, be, kind of become pickups. Uh, and it and then there's like multiple things that get charged up. First of all, there's like this EX meter that gets charged up, right? Uh, yeah, like a, like a special weapon that doesn't get charged up by absorbed bullets. That ah. uh, just fills by killing enemies. Okay, okay. Yeah. But also in the shield mode, when you kill enemies, then you, you that extends the duration of the exactly. shield mode. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. And then there's like this golden bar. That's the third thing that is charging up, or like I guess second thing that is charging up. Yeah, that is your power up bar, and every time you get a full bar, your ship powers up with one level, until it reaches max uh, power up level. And then when it gets max power level, then you get the golden bullets. Then the yeah. bullets change color once again, and then you get like su- super huge amount of score for picking up even like more bullets. The fever mode, and let's say that smiles, but mm-hmm. uh, it's a, a fever mode that gets sustained for as long as your shield is active and for as long as you don't die and drop uh, another power level. Okay. And then when the shield has run out, after a couple of seconds, usually for me at least, <laughs> yeah. th- then you're in the danger mode and then the bullets are actually uh, dangerous. Yeah. So there's just like from the modes that we talked about, there's just like really one that actually kills you when you get killed by the bullet. Otherwise, the bullets are kind of more like pickups than, than bullets in regular, right? Yeah, that is right. Yeah, so the idea came from uh, the Super Nintendo version of UN Squadron. Mm. Uh, <laughs> wow. which what a pull. Which, <laughs> yeah, uh, with, that had some sort of uh, weird health system that always fascinated me, where you have an actual health bar, which is not so common in Japan-made uh, shoot 'em ups uh, And if you get hit in that game, you don't die immediately, but it gives you brief invincibility, a couple of iframes, and then uh, you go into a danger state mm-hmm. where the next hit will kill you. But if you survive that danger state, you can continue playing, only your health bar will be diminished a little bit. Hmm. So that always intrigued me, and I always had this idea: like, what, you know, if, what if there, if we would build on that system, and uh, basically grant you a longer invincibility period, so you could pass through impassable objects, for example. So you want actually the ob- objective is that you want to get hit, so you, you know, you become invincible for a short period of time. Uh, but then, of course, you'd have to deal afterwards with the vulnerability period. Only I didn't want to include a health bar. So it would just be this cycle where the only time you're really vulnerable against bullets is uh, once your invincibility period wears off. So then we basically started building on that, making the invincibility period, or let's say your normal iframes into a shield. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and then also because... Um, I thought it was more elegant to build on uh, absorbing bullets while your shield is up to power up your ship than grab your traditional floating pickups for, to, to power up your craft, for example, you know? So that was another thought. And um, but I, and then, so initially the idea was very simple. It be, was almost like puzzle-like, oh, get hit to survive other more mm-hmm. dangerous attacks. And but I, So I, I kind of left it there all the time uh, because it felt like it was just too simple and too binary, you know? It wasn't that interesting to build a whole game around. But uh, well, uh, once, we, when, once we started um, 
toying with the idea of uh, uh, making a shoot 'em up, I went back to that that idea, and then we started kind of building on that. So then we added also uh, the idea of um, chaining, but not chaining like in Dodon Patch, where uh, chaining is just used for score, but chaining to actually keep your shield up, to keep mm-hmm. you alive for a longer period of time. So make it, give it a more of a survival angle as well. And um, then I had sort of this sort of weapon triangle idea of, okay, uh, well, you're, when you, once your shield is up, that means like you basically can't get hurt. No, you can still get hurt, but uh, like in uh, the system of uh, Frank Herbert's Dune, slower physical moving objects will pass through your shield. So the idea of the um, of enemy missile ammunition came into fruition, where missiles will still kill you once your shield is up. So you need to be wary of that. And then we had the lasers also, the, uh, the third. So you have bullets, three main enemy ammunition types. You have bullets which you can absorb missiles will which will kill you whether you're in shield or you're not and then you have lasers which will kill you if you're not in shield so in danger mode and in neutral mode uh, but will uh you'll be kind of protected against them in shield but you won't absorb anything from them and they will drastically uh diminish the uh, duration of your shield so you need to offset missile suckage or missile drain by continuing to chain as much if there's nothing so there's not enough enemies to kill the missiles will uh or the lasers, the lasers. will will sap away your shield i have to say the lasers are the bane of my existence they they always stress me out because they confine the space so extremely yeah. and then it's it's i and that, get always nervous getting hit by them because even with the shield you deplete the shield and so yeah, if oh, we get man. to talk about like um enemy design and everything i'll have a lot more to say about that about the functions of different uh, different enemies. And, uh, okay, we can jump it in a second. Um, I just wanted to say, like, uh, I, I, the shield mechanic is really like super interesting to me because it seems like there's like this trend going on. Like a lot of designers are kind of like these days are thinking about something like this, where you kind of like create some kind of cycle of abilities rather than just having yeah. like these kind of things that you trigger and then that's it. That was also like, what imme- immediately when we started prototyping uh, caught on with me how. Um, cool and interesting it is that basically you have these three ship states the neutral state uh the shield state and then the danger state and they change how you approach the level so that means that uh depending on the state of your ship you uh, look at uh, the different sections of the levels in a different way so there's basically three different ways to deal with the level designs as a player yeah, and also I felt like, especially with the um, with the fact that you know most of the time the bullets don't hurt you, uh, it it makes the entire game a lot more approachable to somebody who's like really nervous about playing those, those shmups. Yeah, and I I've seen that you also added like a lot of like approachable additional features to the game. Like um, there's like a very elaborate uh, achievement system that tracks your progress. Yeah, so you don't feel like when you die that you lost everything. It's still you're still working towards certain goals. Yeah, yeah, that's something was, that Alter can <clears throat> definitely expand on. Yeah, yeah it was definitely uh, one of our goals to to make the game approachable, but at the same time not water it down for for the veterans, right? And of course, that's a notoriously difficult uh, balancing act. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so the way we approached it is uh, with uh, a different modes um, that play very similar, but have some some key differences. Uh, I was talking about the um, the checkpoint system earlier. So some of the modes have checkpoints, other modes don't. Ah. Uh, some are longer, some are shorter. Um, we have an endless mode uh, as well, uh, which gets really ridiculous. Um, we can uh, maybe elaborate on the on the different ships uh, and stuff later. And then, um, <clears throat> yeah, all of those, you know kind of new uh meta things in the game like meta progression things like there's no there's no actual game progression like you can't unlock uh you can't level up your ships uh permanently from, from play at least. To play or things like that but and- yeah we have achievements we have uh, pretty extensive stats uh we have those uh with titles linked to the achievements so you can uh, display uh, a custom title on your leaderboard entries. Uh, that being said, we have leaderboards, uh, all for the different modes. 
we have like visual breakdowns um, of your of your playthroughs uh, in the on the leaderboards, and we have the the replays. So a lot of content is actually not core game, right? And we mm. have uh, color palettes only... that you can unlock as well. For yeah, the, the color palettes exactly. That artwork in the gallery for, for Steam. Yeah. yeah. So lots of uh, not non core game things that I felt. Uh, when necessary, uh, more though than Michiel. Michiel was much more focused on the on the core gameplay. Not that he, you know, dismisses those things or whatever. But um, yeah, the yeah. the focus was a bit different, right? Yeah, and I'm also more traditionally more of an arcade action type of gamer. Yes. So I'm not so I'm more of a designer who uh, yeah pursues um, intrinsic. Uh, rewards for players than extrinsic uh, rewards for yeah, players. Yeah, and it's it's this, actually I'm I'm perfectly happy with uh, intrinsic rewards uh, myself as well. But I still like the extrinsic rewards mm. and during game uh, game testing. Uh, we very early on we put a lot of focus on getting as many testers uh, as we can, yeah. and we also try to get as many uh, testers from that are not familiar with the genre. Um, that play very different games than, than we play. And also, to you know, we're, we're two, uh, two old dudes, uh, so we wanted to get some, some younger guys in there. Um, and some of the feedback was like, yeah, this is, this is a cool game, but uh, what's the progression? Like, yeah. what, am I, yeah. what am I working towards here? Uh, so some, some players just need that kind of uh meta progression in their games and uh whether you think that's uh the right way to play uh arcade like games or not it's a fact right and we wanted to give yeah. them players something and it's something you can relatively easily implement without uh violating the core uh de- design principles you know yeah exactly. Just exactly stuff that people can unlock yeah. that aren't uh yeah key to progressing uh inside the game itself yeah yeah none, yeah. none of it these doesn't have to conflict with each other yeah are compromising the core gameplay in any way so that's cool yeah the, the arcade more. players are get get like really upset when when you have like things like you can upgrade permanently your ship or you have to play through once in order to unlock something like that would be something things. different yes yeah um, i mean we have unlocks uh for the for the uh, core modes uh, which we also found during testing was kind of a an, a bit of a necessity because uh, we saw that especially veteran shmup players were playing the game quote unquote wrong uh, because <laughs> because it does things a bit different right so so we had yeah. really good shmup players play the game and not engage with the shield system and then they'd be super underpowered mm-hmm. and uh, throw the the euro board around. So we told them, like, guess what? You're gonna have to play the easy mode first because exactly. they wanted yeah. they wanted to jump straight into the harder modes, which would kick their ass, and they would have no idea why. Yes, mm. yeah, yeah, the, 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 the pro players don't want to get hit by the bullets, right? No, exactly. 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 They try to dodge everything so they don't power up their ship. Yeah. Once you force them <laughs> to to engage with the system, uh, most of them uh, clicked with it. Um, but yeah, we had yeah. to get them to to do that in the first place, which is also why, unfortunately, we have a a forced tutorial, which was a bit of a bitter pill to to swallow that we had to add that. But like, yeah, we saw it happen so many times that people didn't want to play the game like we wanted to, them to play, which is the reason to do tutorials, right? The um, hilarious thing that even when you look at YouTube, some people, you know, that uh, do their first playthrough, their first fifteen minutes with the game or whatever, they do the tutorial. They get it and uh, they seem to be into it. And they start their first run in Jaeger mode and they completely ignore what they've learned with Zorio. Yes. Which is which is a <laughs> natural thing to, uh, to happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, we need to kind of work around that a bit. That's that's yeah. something that we're definitely going to try to improve in the future, the, the integration of, of uh, tutorial if, if one is required. I like uh, to think that very the gameplay yeah. is... Uh, quite intuitive uh once you get into it but After it requires a bit a little bit of a mental switch as well mm, yeah. you know like oh i need to actually flying into the bullets is good yeah you yeah. know the shield is not some desperation thing no it's something i need to pursue i need to stay in shield state for as long as possible to power up like even i think those players that 
play the game, do the tutorial. Oh, okay, okay. So the shield, so getting hit by a bullet won't hurt me, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and the shield will protect me. Well, I don't need the shield, you know. So yeah. just. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, still, yeah, because still kind there's of shields in other games, right? But there's like emergency kind of like they're kind of like exactly. lives, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here it's the core thing that you want to be doing all the time. Mm-hmm. It's interesting to see that that there's like downsides to doing innovation. Usually, innovation is considered something that's incredibly positive and it's just good, you know. And it's yeah. true, but there's sometimes also a, a, a price associated with innovation because you're going off the beaten path. That's true, and the price with innovation is always all, also that. Some players just don't like innovation, you know? They want yeah, to course, the same obviously. experience again. Yeah, which is yeah. also fine, of course. Um, that That's yeah. something that, that any anybody that makes anything creatively uh, has to accept. Like, yeah. N- not everything is for everybody. Don't compromise. Exactly. Just accept that, yeah. Yeah, and in that sense, I actually anticipated, anticipated the game to be more love it or hate it or marmite than it ended up becoming, you know? Like, it's... I, w- I was going to... I, w- I was thinking probably be 50-50 the response to it from the community, but uh, it's more like 80-20. Yeah, it seems to me you came out quite all right. People yeah. are, are qu- quite excited about, about this. I think, uh, yeah, because I think you hit a nerve there. As I said, I think there's a lot of other developers working on along similar lines, like trying to question the idea of lives and trying to mix it up a little bit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and of course, I mean, we were far, far from from being the first uh, people to to do that. Uh, Michiel, the, the the other week, he did a long series of tweets um, listing all of our uh, inspirations uh, for the game. Oh, I, I will I will show them now on the screen yes. so we can see. That. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, was, that was that was some really good stuff in there. Great, great. Okay, so let us get into the nitty gritty. I want to know how this game was made. So let's imagine you, we're going to get that to maybe in a second, but let's imagine you have all the um, the uh, mechanics figured out. You can fly around with the ship, you can shoot at things, collision detection is figured out. How do you sit down and create a level in your game? What is the, the What kind of tools are you using? So we do that in the uh, Unity editor. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, I've only been really familiarized with Unity through making this game. So um, Alter is basically in the, uh, what you call it, the scenes uh, segment. Uh, basically set uh, created level environments and then all the different enemies uh, that you can just sort of drag and drop into there and, and environmental objects as well. Mm-hmm. Um Enemies, enemy concept uh, concepts I had designed beforehand in a design document, and then uh, 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 Alter's cousin um, basically created the, the art assets for them, and they have changed over time as well. Sometimes, you know, we the, the, the uh, sprites for them had uh, have changed. Um, and then uh, I assign them different uh, behaviors and flight paths and uh, where they spawn in, etc. cetera. Uh, and the process is very um, Super Mario Maker-like almost. Okay. You know, wow. like you just put them on uh, and maybe uh, Alter can show that uh, like when unfolding one of these uh, things in the, in, in the editor. Uh, so basically set them along a, along a path. We have mm-hmm. three main stage themes that we work in. So mm-hmm. basically you see three main stages. Uh, and then with every loop, because the game is built uh, in uh, uh, several loops, uh, basically I drag a slider to the next loop and then decide which enemy stays, which one gets taken out. Uh, the length of the level may change. The environmental layout of the level may change. And basically, um, if you play just the Jaeger mode, uh, it doesn't change that drastically, but if you compare early stages in Jaeger mode to the later stages in Chimera mode, um, I like to say I got pretty creative with all the different enemy and object types for some very wild situations that you can find yourself into with a quote-unquote limited pool of assets and, and different enemies that we have. Ah, huh, fascinating. So you can basically see all of the enemies that will spawn and level just there exactly. in the in Unity and just, You can drag and drop them from, from the list view and then just like yeah. set them up as you want. And then it's like, okay, this is the next level and then you click on a button or there's a slider and you can go to the next exactly. level. Exactly. Like, S- slide to the next uh, to the next loop. 
pretty much. Mm -hmm. So how do you, in this view, how do you uh, decide how the enemies behave? Because you said you can like create like a path or something like this? Yeah. So you click on an enemy and then there's different movement patterns. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, you, you set them and you set their exactly what their spawn uh, coordinates are. If they move with the map or if they move detached from the map, uh, several several uh, yeah, functions and features. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so, I mean, it's it's kind of like the, the huge advantage of Unity that it comes with such a powerful editor. I mean, Unity is basically like this powerful yeah. editor. Um, and it's kind of built around this idea that you design a game while you play the game, basically. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily the case here. You're not really playing the game, but you at least you see the scene that you're preparing yeah. in Unity, right? And I guess it works less uh, choreographed uh, in practice than, you know, it's more systemic. Mm -hmm. So the, the different enemies have different kinds of, uh, you know, weapons or shot types. And some of them will fire aimed shots. Some of them will fire like fixed fixed patterns, for example, and those start interjecting and intertwining. So it's also a lot of building, going, just pressing play on the on the editor and just trying out how it works in perfect in in practice, and then you know messing uh, uh, switching things up and uh, messing things around. How does so? That's actually a good thing, uh, a good thing to mention. How does that work? How does that um, the bullet stuff and and do you do you have like a pattern editor uh, or do, where do you decide you know how an enemy is shooting and when they're shooting and so forth? That was kind of uh, decided in the conceptual phase mm -hmm. and then uh, sometimes adjusted as we went along during the development pro okay, process. Okay, so these things know? are hard coded, right? Exactly. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so you like basically create like the design document where you describe your all of the enemies that you want to have. Let me let me interject there for a little bit. So, of course, nothing is hard coded. Don't don't throw the H word around like that. Uh, <laughs> it's coded. It's every, coded. Everything. It's coded. Everything it's can be. Coded. Everything could be tweaked uh, by by a designer, no coding involved. Oh. Um, but there's no there's no real uh, bullet pattern editor or something like that. We, we, the game is not a bullet hell game, right? So yeah, we don't have sure. uh, those very complicated and beautiful bullet patterns that a lot of games have. It's much simpler. We have we have simple aimed shots. We have uh, spread shots, burst shots. Um, we have. Uh, Heat seeking missiles, basically, right? But that's all also just shooting out in one direction. Yeah, um, depending but, on the enemy type. Yeah. And for example, a good example to give is, for example, the mini bosses at the end of each stage would uh, initially they would fire all aimed shots at you, but that would make it very that made it in practice very easy to avoid them in danger state because all the shots would be aimed in one position, and it would be too easy to also absorb all the bullets because you could just stay in one place and and soak them all up so then uh we also had some they had also fired some uh bullets that are not aimed and then offset so they get you in more precarious situations but it's okay. not an actual bullet pattern design like in a damaku mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, that's fascinating to hear that you designed the level the enemies beforehand, and then you you kind of created them. Because uh, we from other interviews we also had like the different approach, where it's like we had a you know a, a graphic designer design some some um, some enemies, and then you know the, the designer decided what the enemies do afterwards after we mm. already already created the graphics. Yeah, I yeah, think, no, I I was... think what's what's very important there, um, and that goes for pretty much everything we did um is we we just iterated a lot uh mm. over technical things but all, also design things yeah. um one example that uh laser carrier ship uh it shoots out two parallel laser beams and then a second later it shoots out two spread out like at a 30 and minus 30 degree angle um that was very different in the design doc right yeah, mm. fired I fired three horizontal lasers at first. Something like this, right? Yeah. And then uh, during testing, we found out that it was a bit boring. Uh, and we kind of removed the middle laser and added the two uh, spread out lasers. And that also led to uh, you being able to stay in between the, the center lasers, which is a really fun uh, balancing act to do yeah. uh, without a shield, right? If you have a shield, it doesn't matter. Um, and yeah, that goes for pretty much everything. Like, uh, I'm pretty sure that nothing in the game stayed unchanged uh, 
except for the core movement of your of the player ships that was like day one and it never changed uh uh, apparently i chose the right values for for where those those (laughs) values came from was that also just like a gut feeling or did you like analyze other games or anything like that i have no idea i just uh, picked something that felt good and then of course the (laughs) The rest of the game was was bounced around that, right? Mm. That's that's why uh, that didn't have to change. It was kind of the the baseline uh, yeah. for everything else. But like for example, um, the, two of the biggest changes we had uh, throughout development was stage length. Mm. Uh, Michael can uh, elaborate on that in a second. And the other was um, the players player ships. Uh, how powerful it felt um and that was mainly con- that is mainly conveyed of course through how much stuff you you're shooting out right you're you're vomiting bullets um so i <clears throat> i added in uh basically a single float somewhere that i can just crank up to make you shoot more but weaker so it stays effectively the same right but you feel much stronger because if you're shooting 20 shots instead of 10 shots that feels stronger even though every shot of the 20 shots would be half as strong as mm-hmm. every single yeah, yeah, shot yeah. of the 10 shots right and then also we made the shots bigger uh like but only the sprite um yeah. <laughs> when you're getting more powerful so nothing changes gameplay wise but are you the same strength all the time it just right? looks bigger yeah yeah exactly i mean uh <laughs> you know increase the increase the speed of the background scroll nothing changes mm. it all stays the same but it feels better oh um, so the entire not only the background scroll increases but the enemies still spawn at the, at the yes. same pace yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny yeah, yeah yeah you change nothing you give it back to the testers and they say yeah yeah it's it's all much faster now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not but it, but it feels like this, right? It's all an and, illusion. Yeah, game, game game feel is is uh, sort of what what I uh, tend to to um, you know put the most focus on uh, game feel and UI. That's uh, that's the two things I I think are extremely important. Like obviously, yeah. core gameplay is super important, but like those are the two things that I know how to do. I think, um, and that are super important to me. Uh, yeah, kind of got derailed. What were we talking about? Levels. You wanted to say something about the length of the stages as well. Yeah, yeah that was it's, very. It's not just yeah. the length of the stage of the stages, but also um, the game structure, like mm-hmm. uh, how long a mode would last to clear. You know, like mm-hmm. initially in Alpha Phase, uh, once the stage length was cut down, it took would take one hour for a clear. Mm-hmm. which is now down to almost half of it, you know, like maybe 30, 35 minutes, depending on the mode of the main modes, that is not the endless mode, of course, and not of the omake or short mode. Um, yeah, this was the thing because, of course, hey, I got all these tools now. Let's make some really cool levels that I myself love to play. Uh, but then you give it to testers and they're saying like, yeah, these levels just go on for too long, you know? <laughs> and it's uh, it's one of those things that, you could easily raise that complaint. I would have easily raised that complaint if I would have been playing someone else's game. But if you're making something yourself that you're kind of smitten with, uh, it's hard not to be uh, unbiased about that, you know? So you need somebody else to play it and test it and tell you that uh, harsh truth. So yeah, all stages were kind of cut down like uh, half the size as well as the length of the the modes. And yeah, there's, uh, there's... we started out with a very different game structure for and and type of modes that we ended up with. The thing is, like with the length, right? It's something also that sounds really good on paper, right? Like it's oh, you get more of the game. Exactly. You know? Yeah, yeah. You get more bang for your buck, you know. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I'm reminded that there was like a, um, I think uh, one time there was like a Reddit post on on Shmup uh, uh, Reddit where it's like, oh, why aren't there Shmups that are like 20 hours long? <laughs> Like a regular game, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you play for 20 hours. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That level of concentra- concentration for 20 hours long. Yeah. 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 Well, if you do something like a, a game that has a lot of, uh, let's say, permanent progression, you could do something like that. But a full arcade-like run for 20 hours. Yeah. And of course, yeah. there are games like Gradius Five, which have loops of one hour long. Uh, with ridiculous amounts of loops that you can uh, keep on playing through. 
But uh, yeah, those are the exception and not the rule. It's, it was one of my examples that I brought up when people were complaining about the stage ah. length and the, and the mode length, actually. Interesting, but, interesting. Yeah, I had to concede because at least in Gradius 5, um, there's more varied and different uh, sort of stage uh, situations and, and sort of like stage design backgrounds and, and all that. Yeah, it's, it's easy to burn yourself out. Yeah, it was definitely the, the right decision uh, for Shudmai to uh, um, get shortened like that a little bit. Now everything is much more focused. Uh, yeah. You can get that quick run in, right? Uh, like like a lot of people uh, like to do. And obviously you you can still play for eight hours straight uh, <laughs> if you want yeah. to. Uh, some people do that. Uh, I have done it myself. Um, yeah, but uh, that was... Uh, it was fairly early on in development uh, when we made this this big change. Uh, luckily, and yeah. if it, the, the earlier you can, you can make uh, big changes, uh, the better, of course. Um, but that that taught us that that really uh, valuable lesson. That obviously, you, you, if you think about it, you know it, but you need to experience that yourself maybe once. That uh, you know you need to take uh, earnest feedback uh, to heart, and you need to know what criticism uh is useful for you and what to uh, yeah. how to respond to to criticism and uh you know not not take it personally because uh those those people that said that the stages are too long they didn't say that the stages are bad right they they just uh criticized uh, some part of it and yeah. they, they cared enough to to want it to improve and our whole uh, development process has been very tester driven not test driven that's something else but tester driven uh, yeah. and very community driven um we keep saying that in in every in every uh, interview we do but uh that was really i i guess it was the most important thing uh yeah. having a community early on we tried uh building up that community like we kept inviting new people we've been active on on Shmup junkies discord and on twitter and other, and of course also just uh, friends uh, and and real life friends and all that yeah in our own discord yeah and yeah that's that's definitely it wasn't just the three of us and our uh, other collaborators that drove us forward but definitely also the community yes very much yeah. and i mean still <clears throat> the community is it's not as active as in the you know the the heydays of of development but still there's just something going on every day and uh, like the other week we got our first uh first two pieces actually of uh of like fan mail yeah <laughs> actual physical things that uh fans of the game have given us and that's that's a, a warm and fuzzy feeling that's yeah. hard to to come by you don't oh, expect man. that right we, no we no. already let them pay for the game and now they're sending us free stuff uh, <laughs> exactly just yeah, because yeah. they were enjoying it <laughs> that's lovely to hear yeah, yeah yeah i mean it takes a village to make a game right it's not just yeah. like the developers themselves it's also like the entire community and, and... yeah yeah and yeah if we're yeah if we're handing out advice uh because now we're entitled to be able to do that <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah nah it's just you know listen listen to feedback and also yeah, it's of very course, know what feedback not to listen to like sometimes you get those really you know toxic uh pieces yeah. of of uh, communication just, just ignore yeah. that and or or just uh feedback that uh is diametrically opposed to what you want to achieve with the game's design you know sure yeah yeah if people say yeah. hey you should make this into a bullet hell game then you have to say no we're not yeah. going to do that then the or you need not... to add, add a parry button yes and, uh, <laughs> yeah. to be able to yeah, parry yeah. all the bullets on screen yeah. like dark so, no, that's not what it's about <laughs> exactly know, it's so about the, the game is the game is <laughs> not for that person then and uh, that should also be all right i think also the thing that alter was saying um about for example like increasing the volume of shots that come come out of your craft that's feedback by the maku players hmm. because our uh, initial shot rate was more akin to games like gradius or r type you know where it feels initially more pea shootery your weapon does um so because because that's kind of the design uh framework that we uh, that we use um so okay we're still gonna let you do the same damage but to make it feel more satisfying for the market players, we're gonna just up your shot rate, you know, and mm -hmm. make make you look more powerful than you really are. 
Yeah. yeah, super interesting. Yeah, it it feels like uh, we're kind of like maybe entering like a post Marco era of of shmup development, where it's like the differences are not really that clear anymore. They, you know, you get inspirations yeah, from really, really the game different is a, is a hybrid of old and new in so many ways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. super interesting. Um, just like um, to give an idea, um, how many do you roughly? How many testers were involved in in all of this? I mean, uh, we have like a hundred. Uh, people on there, I think, right? Yeah, yeah but they were yeah. not our testers, right? They were not, they were not our testers, of course, but um, I'm thinking half of them were probably. Wow, yeah. okay, yeah, wow, that's that's significant amount. Oh. Yeah. yeah, so 90, yeah, but uh, yeah. easily about 45 and testers. Also, yeah. from the, from the very 15. beginning, yeah, from the very beginning, we tried to get, um, get those hardcore players as well, right? Those yeah. uh, famous in the, in the Schwab scene players because that's kind of the you know if you, if you can if you manage to uh to convince those players that that your game is not super horrible then uh yeah. that's a pretty big step yeah you need like like i mean it's going to be a huge part of your audience these people right so yes, so course. it's kind of important that that you hit like the taste yeah. of of that yes. of your target audience if you want to use that word yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, of the community that you're trying to talk to so so you said you um you'd already designed some enemies on kind of on paper like on design document but um what about the levels themselves did you also design levels already a little bit or is that something that that's something that you did in the in the tool itself in the tool itself i did that yeah i didn't sketch those out on paper it was kind of fun to just uh build those concepts uh, and immediately try them out as uh, as we went but yeah, a lot of the uh, enemies have their their functions, and their uh, you know I don't want to sound too combo fiend like talking about Marvel versus Capcom Infinite, but uh, yeah, for example, the laser enemies are meant to wall you into uh, different sections of the screen. Uh, the missiles are meant to sort of uh, yeah put something threatening on the screen that is is dangerous uh, in any case. Uh, the the homing missiles are meant to to flush you out like you so you can't uh stay in one position just uh, all the time uh which of course in combination with uh, laser walls and laser grids is uh is, is gets very tricky so i i thought about those kinds of uh enemy functions and how they and how they interplay with each other uh yeah basically that was always at the back of my mind when designing the levels mm-hmm. and then doing interesting things with that but did you have like an idea of like an outline of you know what the, the different levels are going to do or did you just, just say like okay i have one i want to create one hour and a later half an hour of gameplay and i'm just gonna see how that plays out or um so we have three main stage themes mm-hmm. uh, there's a, a stage that is kind of like regular deep space uh which, which later in later loops you get more and more rocks to navigate around uh, and then there's a stage that's very much focused on laser patterns and laser grids. And then there's a stage uh, with uh, massive battleships, you know, classic uh, R-type style, uh, where uh, there's a lot of like turrets, turrets on the top and the bottom of uh, those ships that uh, yeah, threaten you in various ways as well. And collision so, as well. So those, those ships uh, box you in way yeah. harder than the, the laser. And create also some tunnel situations where you yeah. have to navigate to, through narrower spaces. So those are the sort of the three main approaches to the to the, the three main stage themes. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, during the course of uh, all the loops, I kind of started playing with that. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the whole idea is that uh, all the loops are iterative and introduce new enemy types and new situations every time. So you could say that the game has about 50 hand-designed levels uh, just spread across three main stage themes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, so but it's, there's... it's not a loop where just things get harder, enemies fire more shots yeah, and everything. Yeah. It's actual changes to the level layout. Sometimes extra sometimes enemies in- included. things change uh, quite drastically. But also uh, over time, like you, you would have uh, stage 1-1 one, one, and stage 2-1 and stage 3-1. They all share the same theme. And they gradually change. Like you, you, you still have some of the same enemies. Some enemies stay for uh, a number of loops, and then only once you go to the, the third or fourth loop, um, if you skip a loop, that is, um, then you get a completely new stage, right? So it's, it kind of flows uh, over time. Yeah. 
And it, uh, initially, uh, because we wanted to release it much faster, actually, the game, and we had a much more limited scope for it, uh, I wanted to, to uh, structure the game like a, a very old school, early arcade game with just three main stages that would repeat endlessly until you die, you know, see as far as you get, until you reach a kill screen, so to speak, like yeah. your Donkey Kong and what have you. <laughs> uh, but then, yeah, Alter wisely said, like, no, we need to put an ending in. And also, it became apparent that the easiest stages, since we wanted to have this more approachable, uh, gradual difficulty curve, uh, as opposed to a lot of other shoot 'em ups where you get immediately sort of get smacked in the face, you have a brick wall difficulty right out the gate. Um, it became boring for the better players to start in the easy loops again. But if we would give them the option to start at a later loop, they would move. They would lose scoring uh, opportunities. So that's where. These loops, which is the backbone of the game, this whole loop system, uh, was now spread out over different modes. So if you start in Jaeger mode, you start in loop one. But loop one of Krieger mode is uh, loop three of Jaeger mode, for example. Ah. You know, And in each mode you play, when we're not counting the, uh, the two outliers, in each mode you uh, play three loops, which was more in the beginning as well. So three loops of three stages, nine stages. Um, but since we wanted to add more content, we had optional splits in the loops. So if you do fulfill certain conditions, you can open a second portal in each third stage, which moves you up uh, in the loop lo- ladder. So you basically skip a loop. And instead of, for example, going from lo- loop one to loop two, you go from loop one to loop three. You still play three loops, but now you're on a more difficult route all of a sudden. Ah, so it's kind of like it's kind of like like um, you decide to bump the rank, so to speak, right? The rank is something separate that also exists. Do you we also, also have, have a rank, rank system on top of that. Yeah, on okay. top of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how does the rank system work? Uh, what does it influence? It influences a variety of things. There's a breakdown on uh, Charlene's uh, Schmup's Wiki um, mm-hmm. website. Um, so it influences um, enemy shot speed, uh, uh, enemy shot frequency, uh, movement speed of enemies, uh, stage scrolling speed even. Um, and, like the actual uh, scrolling speed in yeah, terms yeah. of the like enemies and, are coming faster? And to a lighter degree, it influences enemy health, but we kind of kept that early uh, because you don't want the enemies to become too spongy, you know? Yeah, yeah, but, I can uh, imagine. Yeah. Um, so what happens is if you... Cl- the only way to let the, the rank rise is clear a stage, no miss. Clear ah. a stage without dying. Mm-hmm. That, that increases the rank with a factor of two. Uh, but if you die during a stage, it decreases the rank with a factor of one. So multiple deaths in one stage can bring the rank down quite a bit also. So my idea of a rank system was to have it not just be something mean to uh, get you off the machine, so to speak, but also, you know, have it more like a proper dynamic difficulty system where if you're not that good, the game will go easier on you. But if you are pretty damn good, then also the game will throw more challenge at you because you can obviously handle it. And also yeah, yeah. because shot frequency is increased with higher rank, that also means that you're going to be scoring more because yeah, because you're going to be bullet, absorbing more, more bullets. bullets is actually the thing that you want if you're playing yeah. full score. Yeah, that's that was actually quite interesting. I found myself like sometimes it felt like the more difficult levels were kind of like getting easier a little bit because I there were so many bullets to pick up, you know. They're easier in a, in a in some ways, but if you get in danger state in those levels, then it's more of a problem. Yeah, definitely. Um, so what from what I heard is like the um, the rank was increasing the difficulty in a procedural manner. So like everything was got got faster and more stronger. Yeah. But you yeah. didn't. It's not like you have additional spawns of enemies or anything. No, like nothing like that. No. Mm-hmm. no. So, so that's kind of like, because it would kind of be weird if there was like additional spawns, but then also then you have the additional loops, which also add new enemies that would be... Yeah, the, exactly. Yeah, there's that. already a lot of variation between the loops and, uh, you know, in, in, in the, the, the stages were already very much handcrafted to, mm. to a certain experience that, uh, 
yeah, that, that would be a little bit too much, I think. Okay, interesting, interesting. So you said that, first of all, you said that the speed of the ship is uh, was something that you found out very, very easily or very quickly and you settled on very quickly. But you said you were experimenting with the shield system for a while. So did you start designing the levels and then you changed later on the shield system? Or is that something that... Before, before we started designing the levels, the main shield system was already done. Oh, okay. In so a, you... in, the pro, in the prototyping phase. Uh, and once we started building actual levels, we started the alpha phase and started the first testing. But uh, we still added and changed and tweaked certain things about the shield system and the scoring system as well. The golden shield uh, came in quite late, right? So once yeah. you're at once you're at max power, um, there's no your, your reason shields... anymore to pick up to start absorbing bullets. So we had to think of something yeah. to incentivize people to still absorb shots. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think that was probably straight up a suggestion uh, from from one of the testers as well. Uh, not so much. I think the idea that you reach max power um, and that bullets would turn gold and w- would become okay. triple the value yeah. and yeah. having the stage bonus uh, f- at the end to add even more to it for golden bullet streaks was uh, was there at that point already. But what the suggestion was by one of our players was, why don't you make the shield, instead of just golden bullets, why yeah. don't you make the shield also gold? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. The, in, the, in the non-maxed out power, you have a blue shield and blue bullets. So he said, like, why don't you make the shield also gold? And then we thought, yeah, that's a great idea. And uh, also, uh, it was probably could have been him that came up, up with the suggestion as well, is that uh, a golden shield gives you one uh, full one whole full second of extra base shield time. So Woo-hoo. it makes linking and chaining a little bit easier as well. Yeah. Okay, it started out as this infinite thing that loops three levels infinitely. Then you decide, okay, we're going to cap it up. I'm going to introduce like an ending or something like this. Yeah. Um, and then you said like you're evolving each stage with each successive loop. It evolves a little bit and changes and sometimes changes dramatically. Sometimes it just like upgrades. Um, yeah. When designing the stages, did you... Um, are you have do you have like a certain path in mind or like a certain strategy that the player like will route, take? Right? Yeah, yeah. No, I I design them more like uh, what would be an interesting challenge, and of course also thinking about uh, bullet absorption. But I don't set out oh this it should have an ideal route like this and that. I think I don't think that's very interesting. That's something that comes with player experimentation, and it's something that uh, should grow from my point of view a little bit more organically. You know, mm-hmm. and yeah. also in the later stages, I think just your your pure evil side comes out. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they get uh, progressively more evil. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like to do also this thing where stages have kind of like a logical flow like stage design and a gradual buildup of challenges that escalate but uh, i can't help myself sometimes to throw players a little bit of an unexpected like monkey wrench in mm. uh, like a spanner in the works but know? also rewards right like you and also rewards a- yeah. after a, a particular difficult section you get like a, a ton of popcorn uh with revenge bullets so you can just score yeah, you can out. soak up a lot of bullets. Yeah. And also, I think actually the spanners and the little monkey wrenches and the little hitches are kind of interesting as far as I'm concerned, because otherwise things become too flowy and too predictable. You know, you want to get people to sit up straight in their chair uh, every now and then and, uh, and, and throw something unexpected their way. Makes it a little bit more memorable as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a really a cool idea, actually, because that's something that's a bit of a challenge when you're designing a shmup and you have like this very long level that you have to think, think, um, you know, how how am I going to structure this? And yeah. you started out immediately with a structure there. You know, you had like, okay, these are my three levels and I, we're going to repeat them over and over again. And that gives you like an opportunity to later on say like, okay, I'm just going to repeat this level now. And now my task is not yeah. just to create a new level from scratch. No, but and it's all I'm part take of this level that exists design as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's all part of the narrative that we devised as well, because the, the the narrative in the game is a full justification of the mechanics and the structure in the game. Oh, because you're defending, of course, your your planet with this experimental shield technology from an oncoming uh, armada that you otherwise have no uh, chance of uh, of defeating or defending against. Uh, so you go on multiple attack runs. Mm-hmm. So first you fly through space to watch the fleet then you fly through their laser defense grid that's around the, the fleet then you're in the fleet itself and then your attack run is done and you start a new attack run and mm. you survive for as long as you can and you do as much damage as you can 
And then the enemies kind of like uh, adapt to your attacks and, and evolve uh, on subsequent yeah, runs. Yeah, they right? figure out, oh, the shield, their shield uh, technology is vulnerable to missiles. Let's fire more missiles at them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that makes sense. That's what, what an enemy would do. They could, yeah. just, they could just stop firing regular bullets, but they, they can't help themselves. Yeah. They no. can't help themselves. There, I yeah. mean, they already invested in the bullet technology. Exactly. What are they going to do? Yeah. 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 <laughs> if you don't fire them all off, you're not going to get a new bullet budget next year. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, um, okay. So we kind of like the next question is, I have to ask about the scoring system because that's something that a lot of people uh, from the, uh, my community are struggling with to come up with like a cool scoring system. But it seems like your um, I, yeah, like your scoring system also some, it was something that evolved more organically, right? Yeah, definitely. I'm, I am a fan of uh, kind of like uh, layered scoring systems that have you sort of run certain uh, tactics in tandem with each other. Uh, and also of scoring systems that are gratifying and, uh, you know, feed, feed you with a ton of endorphins. So uh, in one of those tweets that we did about our influences, I, uh, I brought up uh, Akai Katana Shin uh, by Cave and also Pac-Man Champion ed Championship Edition <laughs> DX. Is that also is super satisfying to play for score? I heard that, yeah. Uh, and uh, especially that sort of gluttonous as one of our uh, main testers, one of our top players, maybe the best player in the game, also described our scoring system as uh, something that, uh, you know, that um, stimulates gluttony. Mm. Like you want to s slurp up and soak up as many bullets as possible, uh, which is satisfying. Yeah. And when they turn to gold, it becomes even more oh, so satisfying delicious. To, uh, to, to scoop them up. Yeah. So that's something I'm a big fan of and also scoring systems that properly escalate. So once you start in max power, your score uh, rises like crazy. The rank starts increasing, more bullets get fired at you. Your score goes even more through the roof. Um, you know, that, that's so the system thing feedback a feeds of. back into itself, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I also yeah. try to make um, the actual score pop-ups uh, oh, as, yeah. as juicy as possible. So obviously, if you've seen the game, you see those those score numbers going up when you when you're shooting stuff and when you're collecting bullets. So one thing we did actually pretty late, like um, we made the big numbers actually big. Like yeah, they, that was in the they, two point oh version. Yeah, in the one point oh version that stayed the same they size. They grow in size to uh, ridiculous uh, sizes if you're scoring in the millions with a with a single chain. Um, and what I also it's a did, very obnoxious thing to do, but also hugely yeah. satisfying for players. Well, we, we paid a lot of we paid a lot of attention that it's not obscuring anything uh, essential, and also you can turn it off uh, in the options if you like to. Um, <clears throat> but one thing I did in the very beginning, like when I first made the, the score pop ups, I just had a single score pop up for everything you do. Right, you you collect a bullet, you get a thousand points or a thousand five hundred points, whatever you're your current um your current multipliers etc so you get multiple instances of you know thousand points thousand points uh very close to uh to each other right and mm -hmm. then i changed it to um if scores are close together they get added up uh into a single bigger uh score thing so instead of you know three times one thousand points you get three thousand points and then you absorb more in the same position position and then that number keeps going up and keeps going up keeps going up until you uh, move somewhere else or stop uh, scoring in in that position right uh, so that's how you end up with millions even though you made those millions over the span of i don't know half a minute or a minute sometimes if you try to stay if you manage to stay in the in the same space mm -hmm. um yeah and that felt really fun like uh because obviously i've been playing the game uh, quite a lot um <laughs> that's that's an interesting uh, challenge you can you can uh try to accomplish yourself like how big can you get a single chain even though there is no there's no chaining system like <laughs> in that sense for for score but visually there is mm -hmm. yeah yeah the the chaining system is relevant in a sense that of course the longer you keep a shield up the more your multiplier will climb um and also you're very right christian uh the scoring system did flow very logically out of the main out of the game's main core play mechanics. Um, so it, it was very logical that, okay, well, a multiplier system seems obvious, but when is the multiplier active? When your shield is active, you know? And everything has a base score for, you know, you kill enemies or you absorb shots, but once your uh, uh, shield is up and your multiplier rises, everything gets, 
you know everything all, all the scores uh, get get multiplied of course um and then also uh, what i really like which was an inspiration from uh, get, uh from uh, cave games for example is stage end bonuses you know like uh, you you get points for your longest uh, shield time for example you get points for no missing and you also get points for uh your longest uh collecting streak of golden bullets so golden bullets become super important in the game uh where and for for no missing it's even better you you get a multiplier bonus let's yeah, let's for... not explain the whole system because it's kind of no, complicated it's, but it's like... complicated and nuanced but yeah. that's the basic gist of it yeah yeah You're... there's just like multiple opportunities for you to, yes. to boost yeah. your score mm -hmm. yes and what i particularly like about the scoring system is that it's not completely antithetical to su to survival play mm -hmm. at a certain uh, till a certain point scoring and survival and shield might uh, go hand in hand you know you want to keep your shield up so you survive you want to absorb shots so your ship gets more powerful so that all gets rewarded with scores and score yeah. bonuses you do something good you, you get scored the, the only thing the point uh, where the yeah. risk reward uh, element kicks in is of course hey I get a lot of points for absorbing bullets. Yes. What if I let enemies sit on the screen longer so mm -hmm. they can flip more, more bullets? And that is where you start the risk the risk taking starts. You know where you uh, start delaying your shots and you, where you start to you know take some real risks to inflate that score. Yeah, but I you know even in my my very few attempts that I I did, I already found myself trying that because you know it's like hey, the bullets don't hurt me. So why don't why do we have to? I don't have to shoot the enemies down now. I can shoot them now later and you know and then yeah. the, the, the bullets accumulate that a little is, bit. That's you know? exactly what we want to do, yeah. Yeah, and when you look at uh, the replays of our top players, uh, especially one guy called Steak Eater, who also described the score system as gluttonous, is that he leaves the, especially on the higher difficulties, he leaves the enemy spitting bullets completely alive when he can. And he mm. only kills the enemies that fire missiles or just, you know, uh, fly around the screen and don't shoot anything uh, or only shoot out suicide bullets when you, when you pop them. Um, so you see him just kind of radiant silver gun like. Uh, leaving a whole lot of en a bunch of enemies alone and uh, only killing sp specific ones to keep his chain up and keep his shield up. Super cool. I mean, it's 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 in hindsight it makes totally makes sense. But uh, you know, I really like that that comment that uh, usually the scoring and survival are kind of like two different ways. You know, uh, either you concentrate on the scoring or the survival. Yeah. But, but and the risk reward usually starts at at baseline level, which yeah. is something I wanted to avoid. And that's why, and that's really frustrating because a lot of newcomers who come in, they start very much on survival and then so they can't like completely ignore scoring. And so that part is kind of like completely not visible for them. Yeah. And, and it's super smart to be like, okay, so that's why we have like this core loop in our game yeah. because we can attach our scoring system to that which kind of like merges scoring and survival into uh, at least it creates like huge overlap between scoring and survival yeah well also what for maybe finally one really big difference of uh you know the the risk reward element is that we have apart from the regular stages and the mini bosses that bookend each regular stage we have uh some proper screen filling bosses that have their own dedicated stages that you trigger either at the end of a mode or uh, for certain special scoring conditions, you trigger their appearance. So, so they don't appear at set times in the run. Um, and uh, they give you a huge score if you de defeat them. But if you defeat them while your shield is still up, you get massive scores, <laughs> several several millions. Uh, <laughs> so timing in, is in also important. Cases. Exactly. So, you know, sometimes you don't, even though you're at big risk, you don't want to kill the boss just yet because you want to get your shield back up, for example. So that uh, that's where the boss fights, when you're playing for score, get a lot more challenging. Super interesting. Um, so the thing I want to discuss next is because kind of like it's tied to um, to scoring is uh, difficulty. Uh, yeah. So you already talked about. I'm assuming you, you, the, 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 the reason, like the, the fact that you had so many testers that could really helped you honing down the difficulty. But also, like the question is quite often that I get asked is, what do you design first? Do you first design the easy difficulty mode and then later on the harder difficulty mode? For you guys, it seems like you started out with the early levels and then piled on top, exactly. right? Yeah, just a very gradual lift, difficulty curve. 
from the first stages that we designed till the last ones. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, you know, then we only afterwards. So it's a bit of a weird process that we didn't really anticipate like that. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the, the difficulty then got sort of distributed over the various modes that we uh, created. It's super interesting to, to be like, okay, the difficulty is getting even higher than, than we yeah. can contain this game. So we're going to create like a separate mode where that contains. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> At the back end of the game, it's actually one continuous game, but then, you know, we sort of divided it into several, several modes. And uh, we wanted to also, speaking of difficulty and approachability and uh, accessibility, if you like, we wanted people uh, to be able to clear most players should be able to clear the Jaeger mode, the beginner mode, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, not to say that it's a complete cakewalk for everybody. For some people that aren't used to playing shoot 'em ups it can already be quite a lot to handle, like seeing all those things fly around and trying to navigate your way through it. Um, but with some persistence and maybe abusing the checkpoint system, you should be able to get to the end and you should feel satisfied and fulfilled that you did it. So not like, oh, I just played a super easy mm. defanged uh, mode, you know, like uh, this is only half the bullets of the regular mode. This is like a, a novice mode yeah. or anything like that. I mean, we, we, still watched, feel... we watched quite a lot of, uh, you know, streamers and, and uh, videos on YouTube of, of people playing the, the game for the first time. And then, of course, they play Jäger mode, which is the, the first mode that is uh, unlocked uh, sort of by default. Um, like if you're a, a somewhat uh, competent gamer, if you if you know video games, then you're going to be able to clear this mode, especially because of the checkpoints. But then Kriger mode is there to, yeah. you know, uh, not that it's not that like Michael said, not like uh, Jäger mode is not the real game because uh, even that can get quite uh, hairy, especially if you play well and s start you know getting the rank up and, and skipping loops and stuff. Yeah, you, uh, you move but, up on a higher route. Exactly, you, you exactly. can do but that, then and you can trigger a, a secret boss that will yeah, yeah, be quite yeah, exactly. a challenge when you face the first time. Exactly. Yeah. But then Krieger mode is different beast, and that does not have checkpoints. And then you get uh, Chimera mode with uh, the endless mode, and then we have the EX uh, versions of upcoming. In the future, it will be all modes. Uh, currently, it's only Jäger mode and Krieger mode, and those modes uh, can get really ridiculous. Like, uh, yeah. Uh, I think Michael, you've you've cleared Krieger, EX Krieger mode with one ship. I've, no, not even. Not I even? haven't cleared the, the ultra hard mode with. Uh, I've I've I can clear all the stages individually, but I haven't been able to tie a full run together yet. Yeah, I've I've cleared it with uh, two of the three ships uh, that are in yeah. that mode. And there's like on the leaderboard, there's only like maybe it's four or five four. players yeah. that have cleared that mode. Yeah. Ooh, that's a spicy mode yeah. there. Yep. Yeah, 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 yep, it is. So it's yeah. the hardest mode, but with like EX with an additional difficulty, right? Yeah, additional yes. difficulty, but also additional power for your ship. So you power mm. up beyond the uh, regular levels oh. to sort of offset the difficulty. So it's just a crazy intense mode. Uh, and there's some extra enemies uh, uh, in there that aren't in the regular modes. Um, I, I really like this, this comment that, that you said that it's um, that you did it for accessibility as well. Uh, and I think something that I found really interesting is that um, you know accessibility starts with like little details that that already are you, you kind of nailed. I think uh, it's like with the names of the modes, right? If this was called easy mode, right, then, yeah. and then that would Maybe already mode. spoil the, the success yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah. In the yeah. in the code, it's it's still called uh, beginner mode and serious yeah. mode, something like this. But from the, pretty much from the beginning, we knew that we're not going to call it that. Uh, you might not be a Krieger, but at least you're a Jaeger. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, And it feels badass to be like, hey, yeah, I beat not on Krieger mode, you know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, but speaking of accessibility, uh, I spend a lot of time uh, on various accessibility things. So if you've seen the the options menu. There's a lot of things that you can you can toggle, um, and from the beginning we we both of us paid attention to, um, yeah, make things not inaccessible. Right, that's uh, mm. that's the way to put it. Maybe uh, difficulty uh, checkpoints, uh, visuals. Like you can you can turn off everything in the game that is not essential. Um, and pretty much all information is always conveyed through v multiple channels. 
Like so, for example, if you go into uh, shield or danger, we have a voice cue for that. Plus, we have a visual cue on the ship. Plus, you have uh, have it reflected in the UI, uh, and the balls change color. So, uh, yeah, you shouldn't be able to miss that. But still, since there's so much going on in the game, right? You can uh, you can turn off the GPU particles. You can turn off the explosions. Uh, you can turn on enemy outlines. Uh, turn off backgrounds. Turn off the backgrounds. Uh, wow. All, all kinds of things, right? And uh, I'm always looking for uh, people giving me more pointers as to what I can add to that. Um, for example, uh, I have uh, I have uh, uh, no no problems with uh, color vision, but some people, of course, do this. Different kinds of uh, color. It's not called color blindness, but you know what I mean, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, problems with color perception. Yeah. Uh, I was looking into, you know, uh, post-processing filters for correcting those things, but apparently that doesn't really work, but I can't test it myself. So I was, mm. you know, talking to some some people that said, no, no, keep that stuff out. Um, just make sure that, you know, nothing is conveyed through color alone. So basically you can play the game yeah. in black and white and uh, you can still play it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, assuming that that might be a bit of a challenge because, like, okay, yes. I personally was paying attention. I was paying the attention to the colors of the bullets, right? Yes. But you can also look at the shield, I guess. Like the exactly, you can, yeah, mm, you can look at the yeah. UI, you can look at the ship, you can, look and you can pay attention to the, the what the ship is saying, yeah. to the audio yeah. cues. Yeah. By the way, how where did that come? Because there's like a Japanese voice is happening there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we were just talking about that this weekend. Um, yeah. Yeah, somebody somebody said like, "Hey, that sounds just like the the, the Google Chrome voice." That's because it is. Oh, um, <laughs> you just typed it in the Google. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. And just just put some put a little distortion and a little echo on it. Um, <laughs> yeah, and you that's can, a you that's a top it. tip for the for the indie developers yeah. when you yeah, don't yeah. can't afford I mean, voiceover. It's supposed to sound yeah. like a computer voice, so why not yeah. use a computer voice, right? Of course. And you you can switch it to a German and a Dutch uh, accent, basically as well, <laughs> which yeah. sounds sounds really so funny. cool. I have to do it now. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we man. all get the same voice actor for our uh, shoot 'em ups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Returning voice acting. <laughs> Google. Yeah. yeah, yeah, super nice. Well, I, basically, I'm I'm kind of like through it with my my core questions. Um, there's just one thing I wanted to ask about um, uh, to uh, how Dagen. So you d- basically remade the game in in Pico Eight, right? Like, so you read it then that entire like do the remake of that game in Pico Eight. Yeah. So how was how was that going from like <sighs> Unity to like Pico Eight? You know, tiny little. Uh, it was it was super fun. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, it's not the full extent of the of the game, right? Uh, a lot of things are are very much simplified, but mm-hmm. the core loop is there. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was super fun. It was also a bit challenging uh, to, you know, get to grips with uh, the token system and uh, uh, performance limitations of, of Pico 8. Uh, first thing I ran into was uh, big scores, right? So I had to use some ah. bit shifting. Um, and also uh, I sneakily added some some trailing zeros to the score. So the last, <laughs> yeah, the the last two digits uh, just don't actually exist, right? Mm. Um, and then uh, I made a system for randomizing enemy waves and uh, automatic progressive uh, difficulty increase. Because you didn't have a level designer for that project. I didn't have a That's level designer. That's true. Exactly. I just That's cobbled true. Some, some programmer stuff to, uh, together, right? And then you have to encode those positions in some strings and... Uh, or abuse the abuse the map uh, the map system and things like that. Um, but was, it was interesting to see how many things you were able to carry over from the original game. Yeah, like the, this yeah. loop system was in there. Obviously, the shield system, everything. Uh, you, you can tell that all these things were kind of like really yes. well worked out. So, so they... yeah, so of course that that really helped that I didn't have to really think about that. Right, yeah, I, yeah. I had to uh, obviously I had to implement it. Um, but I didn't have to think about, I didn't have to come up with new ideas for, for that stuff, right? And, uh, and something that I noticed that really came through is like your passion for the juiciness, right? Like you, oh, you, yes. really, oh, yes. you really made Pico 8, you know, squeeze the Pico 8 uh, yeah, for yeah, that yeah. juice. I, I spent a lot of time on, uh, you know, particle effects and, and things like that. And then uh, Soma, a great guy from, from our community, made the, the sound. 
Uh, ah. So he's, uh, oh, he's yeah. a fan of, of our original soundtrack by, by Ed. And then he made a Pico 8 arrange of the, the stage one uh, theme and just gave that to me. Um, yeah, very, very iconic, very iconic yeah. theme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that, that really works well for, for that game. Um, I had to unfortunately stop uh, after like, I don't know how, how long I went at it for like two weeks, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, so I couldn't, uh, you know, add boss variety or things like that. I was telling uh, Alter that we should uh, include it as an unlockable in the main game. But yeah, I would love that. To build build uh, a Pico 8 emulator within uh, within Unity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, <laughs> the way to do it probably is just to um, actually port it. Uh, I, I was looking into it. That's that's what the Celeste guys did. Oh, they ported all, all the entire Pico 8? No, 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 no. Just the game. So ah, basically, you just yeah, take yeah. the source code of the game, you re-implement uh, the draw functions and things like that. Yeah. Um, and then just uh, copy over the, the code. Uh, maybe, it's such a cool name as well, Shield Mate with an eight. Shield Mate, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Looks yeah. like it's made by by uh, some somebody from Australia. Yes, exactly. That's what <laughs> mate. As well. Shield Mate. Um, yeah, that was that was super fun. Uh, at first, I I didn't want to do it because I didn't have the time, but then uh, Actane uh, kind of roped me into it, and of course, uh, he also made this really fantastic game. Uh, Cross gunner. Cross gunner, big up, big up. Yes, it it feels like it was um, uh, kind of inspired also by by um, by Shield Mate. Like it, it had like this loop concept as maybe, well, right? Maybe some cross pollination. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, the, da the, the danger uh, mode uh, reminded me of yeah, that, yeah. at least where you have to survive until you're. Uh, yeah, you're yeah. Set, you see that the ideas again. are spreading. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Which is great. Um, so since you went into Pico 8 already, you kind of like know the, the kind of limitations. Um, and Shieldmate is kind of like also already a game that doesn't really use that many buttons. So that's, that wasn't a big problem. But there's like a bonus design question that I'm asking every, every designer that I invite here. And it's like, you know, and quite often you have a lot of buttons in shmups. So for example, you have stuff like uh, shooting, you have bombs, and maybe, mm -hmm. I don't know, like a slowdown, right? That's a, that's a Denmark pattern. Yeah. Kind of like. um, imagine if you may, had to make a Denmark in Pico 8, where it's just two buttons available, how would you do, go about it? Would you, for example, drop the shooting button? So it's always auto shooting, so you can have the bomb and the slowdown button. Or would you keep the shooting for at, at all costs and kind of like try to cram the other functions to the other button? Wow, that's a, that's a good question, yeah. Um, Depends on kind of a, on the game you want to make, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I like Just gut feeling. manual shooting, especially with our game where shot rate matters, it, so. where sometimes you want to shoot less and sometimes you want to shoot more. Um, so... Of course, we cheat. We uh, put uh, push both buttons at the same time for ah. another for a third outcome, you know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. arcade style. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Press uh, several buttons at the same time. Well, what what do you reckon, how they can? Um, so we we actually have uh, a third button and should by the oh, oh right uh, it's, uh, it's the barrel roll the much contested uh, obviously yeah. high priority should be the main button basically. Yes, there's, there's some, <laughs> There's some real some real history there with the with the barrel roll. So if it would be uh, a GameCube game, the barrel roll would be under the big green. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> but but pressing that, uh, yeah, pressing both buttons, that that would be could be weird. One thing we actually did in Shield Might MX while we were discussing the barrel roll with some of the testers was um, we didn't set it to a button at all. We set it to a movement. So you'd go, you'd go up, down, up uh, for an up barrel roll and down, down, up, down for a down barrel roll. Felt absolutely oh, yeah. horrible uh, in, a, in, in a shmup. Yeah, don't, don't do that. Uh, you know, maybe somebody else can make it work. <laughs> we couldn't. Uh, it, it was it was really bad. Yeah, yeah. So, for extent for extended barrel discussion, I I will um, recommend you guys listen to the uh, interview with Mark. Uh, yeah, yeah. From <laughs> yeah. Electric Underground, you, you, yeah. went, you <laughs> elaborated very much on that the barrel. But roll. you know, yeah, yeah. maybe maybe for for Pico Eight that could work. Uh, like yeah. let go let go of the shot button for a frame, uh, press right and shot and you barrel. Yeah, 
Yeah, something like this. But yeah. but I have to say, like that's a, it was actually a really cool point. Like uh, one, like you keep the shoot button, but then make it so that there is reason not to shoot. And it's a it was a good point that in your game, you know, you sometimes want to keep the enemies alive, I guess, right? So that's why you don't yes. want to shoot yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. especially in Jäger mode or in the in the easier stages, um, I usually spend very little time shooting. Because you want to be gob- you want to be gobbling up stuff, and you only you know tap shoot uh, to get some some shield back. That's it. Later later on, you can't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so moving on. So uh, okay. So you finished um, uh, Shield Paint MX, and you I guess you're working on the on the Switch version right now, right? That's that's the thing that it is. Yes. On on the platter. So that I, I saw the release was at the end of this year. Is that still? Um. Yes. In the, the cards. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, that is so, the goal. That uh, is the it, goal. Yeah, it has proven uh, much more challenging uh, than expected. Uh, but like all of those expectations were just based off of nothing. <laughs> so no. No. it's the first time we're doing on. Yeah, exactly. Time, exactly. You know? I'm still yeah. hopeful uh, that we're gonna make it, but um, yeah, we'll see. If if we if we can't because we don't want to release a. Uh, somewhat broken version or something of yeah. course so if we're not going to make it we're going to retweet one of those gold uh gold background jpegs yeah attention gamers <laughs> and apologize <laughs> no it's uh unfortunately that's just a thing that can happen right um yeah, yeah. i'm not saying that it's gonna but it and we don't want it to happen no yeah. of course not i would love to release this tomorrow but in its current state um i mean the the game works uh perfectly on switch um it's just not performing uh up to you know what I wanted to to perform. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean I just completely understand, and it's kind of like a bit ironic uh, to some extent because you said like you know the huge advantage of Unity is that you can port it easily to different platforms. Yeah. But there is it's it's kind of like the problem with Unity it always says yes to things, but yeah, sometimes yeah. it actually means no. No, but I mean know. that's that's not Unity's fault. That's yeah. Uh, it's just uh, there's a lot happening in the game, and some concessions need to be made. Um, yeah, yeah. The actual porting process was was actually easy. Mm-hmm. To to get it to just run, uh, yeah, that's that's fairly straightforward. Sweet. Um, so uh, broadly speaking, I, I'm I'm assuming you're kind of happy with the way uh, Shieldmate came out, like like the the game kind of kind of game that you have on your hands right now, the kind of feedback that you received. I'm quite proud of it. It's, I I think yeah, you have good sure. reasons for <laughs> for doing. <laughs> is, is there anything that that um, stands out that you're not quite so, uh, satisfied with, or is there anything that you were surprised by how well it came out? Um, I think. What uh, what we would like to do for uh, a sequel is just do all the stuff that we limited ourselves into not doing for the first game, which is of course, you know, have a a little bit more of a lavish presentation, uh, have more varied locales, more varied stages, more varied enemy types, uh, something that comes with a larger project. So that's something that we're looking for, um, and I'm just very happy with uh, especially. Uh, we seemingly managed to balance uh, the game for uh, beginners as well as uh, veteran players. Um, and I think at the core of that, it's not just like the different modes that we did, but it's also the shield system itself, uh, which on one hand offers uh, a lot of leeway to players because they can ignore the threat of bullets for a long part of the game. But it also demands its its uh, own kind of mastery that you can um, challenge more uh, hardened uh, Shurma players with. So I think that turned out very well, uh, maybe much better than we initially would have thought. I mean, it makes sense. It's kind of like built into the DNA of your game, right? Like it's kind of something that is kind of like foundational piece of of of, of what your game is all about. It's it's in the yeah. name, <laughs> basically. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Yeah, super nice. Uh, is there anything that you wish somebody told you uh, uh, before you started making this game, like some some kind of piece of advice or something? I don't think we had any like big surprises. Um, we knew, of course, that it was not going to be easy and not always a, a smooth ride. Actually, I expected it to be harder in some aspects. Um, obviously the hard part was still hard. Um, the thing that this is not only the first game that we're making, but it's also the first game that we on, 
on itch and steam uh, self-published um that's a whole uh, other discussion there of course um lots of uh, things that we learned there as well um also not really surprises because we didn't have any expectations right but um i mean yeah even even if we made a good game uh, which i hope we did and uh, we're proud of it that doesn't mean that it's uh, you know making enough money for us that we can we can live with it um so going forward uh, you know our plan is to uh, gradually increase uh, things in scope um maybe you know reduce the day job a little bit uh, to be able to to spend more more time on on this thing um but yeah it's gonna be an interesting journey for sure do you guys already have some some kind of like ideas for the next project in mind oh yeah so many mm. <laughs> yeah, I still need to write the design doc, but it's all uh, it's all it's all, all, it's all there. <laughs> around in my head. Yeah, yeah. no, no, but, yeah. but seriously, like uh, we we have some we have some ideas for uh, more shmups, for more shield might, uh, for other games as well. Um, yeah. as, I said it initially, right? We've been uh, or I've been tinkering with Unity for a long time, but also the, the two of us. Uh, the two of us have been have been tinkering with uh, with game dev for a long time now. We have a couple of prototypes uh, that we made for completely completely different things. We have some uh, ideas and pitches for for other games and other genres that we would still love to to revisit uh, at some point. Mm. I think it's likely that uh, we're gonna be staying with Shieldmite for a bit longer uh, before we tackle something else. Shield Man Cinematic Universe. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's how we do it today. <laughs> Get Scarlett Johansson on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know the, the Netflix anime and, and all those things. <laughs> of course. Um, but yeah, we we have we have a lot of ideas. Uh, this is only like this is the first thing that we worked on that really came together really well quite quickly. Like from the from the first prototype on, we we said you could see that there was something there, right? And that was never the case with the games that we previously made. Not mm. that they were complete ass, but, uh, you know, they didn't, like, they, that, didn't, uh, they didn't feel special. There's they, something special about here. Yeah. 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 That's super nice. Okay. So what you're saying is people should pay more, keep an eye on, on, on hit, hit P studios, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Please do. Please do. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, where sure. can people check out your stuff? So we have a discord mm -hmm. you're uh, very welcome to join. Um, it's probably linked on our store pages, right? For Shield Made on Asian I would, Steam. I would think so, yeah. It yeah. must be. It must be. I, if yeah. not, I will definitely post it on, a, yeah. on the screen right now and doobly-doo downstairs. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Also, just, uh, yeah, you can check us out on Steam and uh, on Itch. And um, you can follow us on Twitter or X or whatever the F it's called these days. <laughs> yeah. uh, and on uh, Instagram as well. Okay, sweet, sweet. Yeah. And and uh, uh, Haudegen, I saw that you are quite quite often also hanging out in the Shmup discords. Yeah, and Michael as well. Um, huh? yeah. I'm, I'm usually in the Indie Dev channel there, and uh, Michael is in all of the channels, uh, but in the Indie Dev channel as well. Uh, I quite enjoy that. Um, so we've obviously we, we've made uh, friends with uh, some fellow uh, Shmup devs, and it's just all around the. A really good time yeah. uh, being there. Some of uh, the people you've been speaking to as well. Yes. Like Bog yeah. Hog. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's where I'm recruiting basically my interview partners yeah. from. Exactly. <laughs> that makes yeah. sense. That's that's the place to go. Yeah. Big up Terrarian Games as well. Moby Chan, aka Pixel Licker, and uh, BB, aka Undermog Games. Yeah. Shout out. Shout Those out. are the people that we've, uh, the, the last three are the people that we formed the Indie Shmup bundle with on uh, Steam Ooh. as well. Ah. So you can uh, get a bundle of Shield, Madden Max, Operation Steel, Terra, Terra Flame, and uh, Dead End City. Yeah. Oh, that's some really good names there. Yeah, great games. Sweet, sweet. All right, guys. So I'm not going to keep you uh, awake any longer. Uh, I'm, it's really our pleasure. It was a huge pleasure having you here. And, uh, yeah, was this great was fun. fun. Uh, also, yeah, uh, being on, an, on a podcast uh, interview, whatever, uh, with a bit of a different focus than, than what yeah. you're usually talking about. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. And also been a pleasure to finally talk to you after, you know, we've interacted a couple of times. And, 
That's true. It's always a bit different doing it face to face and then in, in, in a Discord. Uh, absolutely, yeah. No, it was it's interesting to uh, for me also to like to, to like to see like the different approaches that the people take in in, in developing shmups. It's it's really exciting to yeah, compare. I imagine they're quite different. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys are gonna see later on when they, when I release the interviews. It's it's yeah. Uh, there's commonalities, obviously. There's there's crossovers, but also the very very different approaches sometimes. So that's super exciting. All right, we're going to wrap it up, but maybe uh, do, do we have some last words of encouragement for aspiring shmup devs out there? Shmup uh, development is really something you need to do out of a passion, first and foremost. It's not the uh, the cash cow. It's not uh, you know the, the type of game that you're going to get loaded with. Uh, but it's also, I think, very important that we keep that passion alive and that we keep making these uh, because they're amazing games that more people should play, uh, which is also why we wanted to focus on approachability and accessibility because uh, yeah, we want more people into the genre. Absolutely. Keep the passion alive. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Keep the passion alive. That's right. Thank you again to Mikael and Alte Haudegen for joining us today. And for you guys out there, if you have any additional questions, be sure to post them in the comment section. If you can't get enough of those interviews, I have three more interviews on my channel already out. One with Dan Bo, one with uh, Barcock, and one with uh, Charlene Excelsior. And they are great. And there's one more interview planned in the future. If you don't want to miss that, this is your reminder to subscribe. If you like what you're seeing and you want to support my work, I have a coffee set up at coffee.com slash lazydevs. And yes, my supporters usually get early access to those videos if you can't wait that long. For now, thank you so much for watching and see you next time around, guys. Bye-bye.